Okay, welcome everyone. Welcome to our next lecture on machine learning. Today we talk about support vector machines. Alone, the phrase support vector machine sounds so exciting to me. A machine, right? So this is so concrete. At the end, it is just a method, okay? But with a very nice name, okay? Also support sounds so positive. So I think this is a well um, chosen title for a nice, really nice method, which we go into detail today, okay? And we will look at lots of details. However, before we start, let me very briefly, there was a question in the questionnaire. So I didn't understand Bayesian model selection, that it's quite difficult. So what, for example, what's the meaning of evidence, hyperprime, hyperparameter, uh, hyperposterior? So just very quickly, let me show you again the slide. I try to improve it a little bit. So, um, Let's see, maybe this one. So basically, um, the idea of model selection is the same as Bayesian inference in general, right? In Bayesian inference, there are some knowns and some unknowns. You put everything in a big graph, and then you do inference about the unknowns. If some of the parameters are hyperparameters, it's just a relabeling of part of the parameters, right? So, and the reason why they are called hyper, um, if, you, if you look at it, like, like this in a graphical model, like a hierarchical um, estimation problem. So suppose you have the parameter theta for the degree of for coin coming up heads, and then you're throwing once, and you throw again, and so on and so forth. So you throw several times. Then your observations will be this, and you do inference about the parameter. However, if you want to be fully Bayesian, typically you would say this thing has a prior, and the prior might be a beta distribution with parameter 1 and 1, or with parameter 0 and 0. But maybe you say, oh, I'm also not so sure about the parameters of my prior, so why not make them parameters too? So we put them up here, okay? And then we would say the distribution of my theta down here um, is basically controlled by some other unknown variables. Those are actually the parameter of my problem, of my experiment. Those are now further parameters, and since they are kind of a level up, I call them hyper, okay? I could have called them meta parameters, but probably I would have to pay something for this now, right? So meta is not possible to use anymore, right? Maybe if there's a company called hyper, maybe then we also have to rephrase this one. So those are hyper parameters, okay? And everything that happens down here, having a prior, having a posterior, having an evidence, having a likelihood, in a way, we have it up here too. We also have a hyper prior, we can have a hyper posterior, and we will have a hyper evidence, okay? But those are just names. This hyper prefix is only there to give you orientation on what level are we here, okay? And of course, oh, but I'm not so sure about A and B, right? So I should get hyper hyper, right? So I should come up with even further stuff up here, right? Some parameters that would describe that one, and then I would have a hyper hyper prior and the hyper, hyper evidence, and so on and so forth. So these words, they should just orient you where you are in this diagram, okay? So that's it. But in general, you can think about it as there are unknowns and knowns, and you want to infer the unknowns. That's it, okay? But by having this hyper structure, this, this kind of hierarchy of things, kind of you can sort the stuff. So you first might infer these ones, and then you do that one. Or you do maximum likelihood up here, and then you do Bayesian inference down here, and you are having this empirical base, for example, that I showed you last time. So don't get confused by these things. Now, what about this model? So the model is like a super hyper. It's like a meta hyper, okay? So it's like one, it's also a hyper, hyper, hyper parameter in a way. How is it? So maybe we have on one piece of paper, we are doing linear regression. On another one, we are doing support vector machine. Then my model would be using this, chalkboard or that chalkboard, so using a regression model or using a support vector model. In a way, this is just like having yet another random variable which I don't know. And then depending on this model variable, I'm choosing one graphical model or a completely different graphical model. But in principle, it's the same thing. It's an unknown variable. I can have a prior over it, right? So SVMs work super cool, so my prior for the best model will be 0.8 for the SVM and 0.2 for the linear regression or something, okay? So it's all the same stuff, 
But since there are on different levels, they get sometimes special names. Okay, so that's Bayesian model selection. The nice thing about Bayesian model selection is actually the basic idea is super simple. It's just base rule, okay? But you apply base rule then on several layers, but it's always the same idea. And all these confusing things that I worked out here for you, I just did it for fun because often you see in papers you, and someone says about a hyper prior something and you might not know what it means. And so this should be a, a super simple example, kind of abstract where you can look it up in a way. So what was this with the hyper prior? Ah, okay, it's just another level of parameters, okay? So don't worry too much about it. Um, what else was unclear? Uh, yeah, you like the coding examples. If it works out, I will do it again, but it's not always working out. Today we will have a, a, some theoretical stuff and at the end there will come lots of codes, but um, only at the very end, I think. Okay, so sometimes it works, sometimes I can't do it. Good, so far so good. Let's continue now with the next topic. Um, but before, let's look back. So what have we seen? We've seen Lots of stuff with probabilities, right? So basically everywhere there was probabilities and I was behaving very Bayesian about everything, right? So you should apply everywhere base rules. That's the way to go. However, I told you already, sometimes practical algorithms um, are not possible with base rule because they are difficult integrals to solve. And so in principle, it's a nice formalism, but practically often we have to approximate with some strange frequentist method like MCMC or stuff like that, so which are then Bayesian at the end, the whole method is Bayesian, but then you use some heavy tools from some other parts to approximate your true solution that you believe in. Um, however, also linear regression, a classical method, I think can be best understood with having probabilities in mind and having base rule in mind. Um, okay, then we looked at this matrix differential calculus, fine, that was just a, for your toolbox, and we looked at model selection, and the Bayesian model selection is also kind of the Bayesian point of view, and there I also showed you a couple of things where sometimes you need to approximate stuff. However, we also talked about cross-validation, and cross-validation is not necessarily Bayesian or anything, so cross-validation is very practical, very down-to-earth, so that's a very classical method that everyone uses, whether you're Bayesian or not, right? Just because in machine learning we are very much about prediction, so we don't care whether we can prove something about our model. If we can, great, right? So we, it makes us happy, but it wouldn't stop us from applying it. So we apply it, and then we check on test data whether it works, right? And so if it works on test data, then we are fine. So this is a very practical approach, which might be not very well founded. However, maybe in 20 years someone will found these heuristics that we are using, okay? So that's the story here. Now today we talk about support vector machine and that is a, a method that is not super Bayesian. So there is no base rule, okay? So now we start with something completely different. I'm a bit exaggerating, but yeah, it is something completely different. Um, before I had a slide in here, please reset your brain, forget base rule, okay? So forget base rule now for now, okay? So let's look at classification problems, but more in this classical SVM point of view. So you can forget everything that you learned about. So we could formulate the classification problem as follows. We haven't seen it so explicitly, but I, I'm sure you know already what it is. So given some patterns, which are some vectors or locations in the vector space, or some scalars already only, and we have some class labels for each of these patterns, and here we only have two classes, plus one, minus one, because this is a simple case to talk about, okay? It can be generalized, but this is a simple version. Then the classification problem is, please find a decision function f of x that will predict the true label for a new pattern. Okay, and this is the basic problem that we are dealing with when we have images of cats and dogs and we want to train a neural network that can decide which is which, or when we have MNIST digits, that's exactly a classification problem. Now having already you influenced with all these probabilities, now you see already, yeah, there's a joint distribution between X and Y and kind of finding a decision function is like an estimation problem. Yeah? Finding right, the, the right function which minimizes some expectation or something over this joint distribution. However, today we take a slightly different perspective. However, of course, you shouldn't forget completely about it. And sometimes it's, it's useful also in these approaches. But today we look at the problem slightly differently. 
So first of all, a couple of words here, so notions, so Begriffe, okay, that people sometimes use. So first of all, classification problems are supervised learning problems, okay? Why supervised? Because the class labels are given in our training set, okay? So that's the first thing you to keep in mind here. Then there are different cases to look at. There's the so-called separable case. So that's a case where basically there's a gap in this vector space between the positive and negative patterns. So there is the option to choose a perfect decision function that all patterns of one class are on one side and all the other ones are on the other side. So that is, of course, a simplification that is very useful to derive the support vector machine. Later on, when you have real data, you never know whether it's fulfilled or not, okay? However, it's nice to assume it. It's, it makes our life here easier. Then there's the non-separable case. So this is dropping this assumption. And the plan for the support vector machine will be first to derive the um, separable case. And then once we've done that, we will generalize it for the non-separable. Then the next one is the linear case. So the linear case is now orthogonal to the other separation between separable and non-separable. The linear case is just saying the true decision function is the linear function. Okay, so that's another notion. And then there's the nonlinear case where the true decision function is the nonlinear function. And maybe now after talking so much abstractly, let me give you an example on the board. Um, let me get some chalk. So suppose now our location space is basically, um, yeah, this is the space of all the axes, the blackboard, okay? And so I can put a plus here for my class plus one, and I will put a minus here for the class minus one, okay? Then this is already classification problem. So the data is given by the locations and by the label. The label is shown as the sign that I'm drawing here. This is now a separable problem because there's a gap between the two classes. Now, if you want to make this mathematically precise, what separability really means, we would need our joint distribution and we must ensure that between the two classes, there's an area where the density of x is zero, okay, where we never hit a point. So that would make it mathematically super safe. However, let's forget about it. Let's keep it more intuitively. So if there's a gap, it's separable. It could be that we have problems where it might be clear that there's kind of a classifier that could split these data here into two classes. However, the classes are kind of overlapping, right? Because it's noise. So maybe one cluster has been generated by a Gaussian distribution. The other one with the Gaussian distribution where the mean is a little bit shifted, but sometimes we are unlucky and we get another minus over here or maybe a plus over there. But overall, kind of, it makes sense to say this is a true decision function. However, sometimes we are wrong because the classes are overlapping, okay? So this is a non-separable case. This is a separable case. Now, what about the um, nonlinear setup? So in the nonlinear setup, can you still, by the way, can you see what I'm, yeah, you can still see it. So I can draw up to here. So what about a nonlinear setup? A nonlinear setup would be an image like this, for example, right? I have one cluster of points, which is inside, and I have another cluster of points, cluster, which is outside. Now here's a perfect separation, would be like this circular line here, okay? S um, separating the inside from the outside. In principle, yes, why not? Right, every outlier problem can be seen like a classification problem, right? Having the data that we want is class one, and the data we don't want is class minus one, okay? So that is an example of a nonlinear set setup, okay? So it is really this intuitive stuff here. Good, so those are the different cases we look at. Then, so there's a classification problem. Then there are also classifiers. So what are classifiers? Classifiers are methods, algorithms, yeah? that solve classification problems. And they are linear classifiers. They try to learn a linear decision function. And they are nonlinear classifiers. They try to learn a nonlinear decision function, OK? And that's kind of separate from the basic setup here. So you can choose either. So for example, even if you have a linear problem, of course, you could choose a nonlinear classifier, right? I mean, you can learn a nonlinear function. Maybe it specializes to a linear one through regularization or whatever. So, we will talk about support vector machines in three parts. So first we will talk about the linearly case, the linearly separable case. Yeah, so that is nice and simple. 
Then we generalize that solution to the linea linearly non-separable case, so still trying to find a linear solution, but for the non-separable case, and then we will look at the nonlinear case. As a preview, the nonlinear case will be the kernel trick, okay, that you might have heard of. So the kernel trick is a trick to non-linearize, okay, hard to say, a linear method to a nonlinear situation. Okay, so you have a method that is linear, then you use these kernel tricks, and then you have a nonlinear method. Okay, so that's quite fancy and received a lot of attention. However, today we will focus on that one, the linearly separable case. So let's have a look at it. So we assume that our patterns are linearly separable. So far so good. The slides again are just very verbose, okay, writing everything out for you. So, little preview, we will introduce today the linear support vector machine, which is a supervised learning method, okay? Basically what it does, it cuts the space of pattern into two parts. Okay, so far so good, that's what we definitely want. However, how does it do it? It does it by choosing the unique maximum margin hyperplane, okay? So, hyperplanes on the board are just planes or just lines. Hyperplane is again Hyper, there's no company yet that it's called, no, there must be a company called Hyper already. Anyway, so a hyperplane on a 2D space is a line, a hyperplane in a, two, in a 3D space is a plane, right? And in principle, a hyperplane in a higher dimensional space also cuts the higher dimensional space into two pieces, okay? That's basically it. So, and this is achieved by solving a so-called constraint optimization problem. So an optimization problem is a function you want to minimize or maximize, and a constrained one is one where you have side conditions, okay? So, and it has this weird form. We minimize the norm of some vector w, okay, with a side condition that certain inequalities should be greater or equal than one. So the ba basic idea here is these equalities, as we will see, they will ensure that we are correctly classifying all the data yeah, and the first part is ensuring that we are maximizing the margin, okay? And this is what we are going to derive. So, by the way, intuitively margin is like the, the gap between the data. So let me give you also another example on the board why maximizing the margin might be a good idea. So let's see how I can erase this. So let's take this part here and um, look at an example. So those are my positive examples and those are my negative examples. Now they are linearly separable. Yeah? In principle, I can draw a lot of lines between them and they separate the solution perfectly, right? The plus, plus examples are on one side, the minus examples are on the other side. Here's another solution. Here's another solution. Okay, is there one of them that you would prefer? Yes, probably the one that is like going like vertically between it because it's kind of having large gaps to all the neighbors. This one here kind of, yeah, it's kind of close to the example. So if now there's a little bit of noise on the data, we might make mistakes. So it's better kind of to have one which has like a large gap between the examples. And that is basically the vertical one here. And there I can have really a wide road between them. And now this thing here is called the margin, okay? So this is basically the, um, yeah, the distance between the examples. And you are looking for those, that straight line that is maximizing the margin. And like geometrically, when you imagine now turning this thing around, yeah, the margin for the other lines kind of they are thinner, okay? And you are orienting this, this long plane in such a way such that the margin is maximized. Okay, that is the idea of maximum margin classification. It's like a heuristic to get a good solution. Surprisingly, this maximum margin idea can be formulated like this. So, by the way, I will derive it in detail, but why might it now be nice to have something like that? Because then you can go to your numerics guys, okay, and they have Fortran software for it, or some other optimization software. They know how to solve these problems. They go to competitions. It's like horse racing where they, that their different algorithms run on these, these problems here with gigantically large matrices 
and then you will have a leaderboard who's the fastest, who can serve it the fastest. So they really like these problems and they really have worked it out how to do it. So we reduce our problem, our classification problem to an optimization problem, which is super popular in the numerics community, okay? That's great. Then we can use their method and do machine learning, okay? And kind of we are again doing sharing of the work, right? So they figured out the super fast numerics algorithm. We just formulate our problem in a clever way and then we have a great solution, okay? So that's basically the idea of the support factor machine. So let's see, um, let's see how we can derive this problem here, okay? So how can we derive it? So how maximizing the margin can be formulated as a constraint optimization problem, okay? So that's what's coming next. So first of all, Let's introduce a lot of words now. So first of all, what is a hyperplane? So a hyperplane now here is mathematically given by a pair of a vector w and some offset b, okay? So now how does this define a hyperplane? Basically the hyperplane is given by this equation. You calculate the inner product of the w with some example x plus b and if it's equal to zero, then the set of points x defines the hyperplane, okay? So that's it. So um, let me maybe um, show you on the board. So this is something you should really try. By the way, this is just another notation. This with the, with the um, sharp bracket here, the angle bracket, that's just a notation. I think physicists uh, like it. They like to write um, inner products between two vectors like that. I like to write inner products like the W transpose X version, but this is exactly the same as that one, okay? So, um, now, why is that a plane? So, in principle, this is now linear algebra, right? So, suppose you have a vector w, and you have another vector. Uh, oh, let's make it shorter. So, this is x, yeah? Then, um, this w defines a plane, yeah? That's what we learned. So, what plane does it define? It defines a plane which is, like, orthogonal to this vector. Why do we do it so complicated? Why not just define the plane like this? Because in 3D, for example, yeah, I could also define a plane with one vector by saying all vectors that are orthogonal to that one are defining the plane. And that generalizes also to higher dimensions. So in principle, I only need a single vector to de describe a hyperplane, okay? So that's very elegant. Maybe on the board, it would have been possible to describe this line with this vector W, but it's more convenient to use this plane or line orthogonal to this one. So now, how can I kind of see whether the x is on the left, left on the right hand side of this plane? I just project it down onto this vector w, okay? And then I need to measure the length over here. And if it's a positive number, then I'm on the right hand side. If it's a negative number, it's the other one. So let's look at it a little bit more detail. So what about this point here? So how can I calculate it? I write down the formula for you. So it is basically, projecting, uh, taking the inner product of x with my weight vector w, this is giving me this length over here. So this is w transpose times x. So this is a real number, yeah? So this is really measuring in centimeters, for example, the length from here to here, if I put a ruler. Now, how do I get this vector, which is the projection of x onto w, just by multiplying this with the vector w? Of course, this assumes that the vector w has length one, okay? If it doesn't have length one, so the vector w can have an arbitrary length, then the whole thing might not be like that. So I first need to ensure that the w is normalized. And so this can ba be done by basically dividing by the norm of w, okay? And this is just simple linear algebra stuff. I mean, it's not that simple, but it is kind of simple. I think I, or do I have to take the square root here? I, maybe I have to use the square root over there. Let's check that. So how can I normalize a vector? So normalized vector should have w times w being equal to one, right? That's the squared norm of the w. And luckily, if the squared norm of the w is equal to one, then also the square root of the norm is equal to one. So the length is equal to one. So if I have an arbitrary vector, and I divide by the square root of w transpose w, yeah? And I take the inner product with itself. Oh, 
okay, great, then I get W transpose W divided by W transpose W, and that is equal to 1. Okay, so dividing by the square root of W transpose W is normalizing the whole thing. Okay, great. By the way, taking square root and having vectors on the board, isn't it dangerous, kind of, right? What is the square root of a vector? I don't know. I didn't use it. I only use the square root for scalars. This thing is a scalar. Otherwise, I wouldn't have written it with the square root. By the way, this divided by sign, isn't it only defined for scalars? Yeah, I use it in a mixed fashion. So for the bottom part, I always have a scalar. So it's just the scaling of the vector on top. Okay, so you always have to be careful with notation. Good, so far so good. So that is a way to um, pro project a vector onto here. But let's be very careful. There are two w's, right? So there's one over here, and then there's one down there. So I can also rewrite the whole stuff like this, w transpose x divided by w transpose times w. Okay, so this thing here is a scalar. Yeah, that's kind of calculating the right um, factor that I need to put in front of the w to get exactly this point over there. Okay? Okay, so what if I have a point on the other side? If I do the same operation, I will get a negative number, right? For the projection here, for this projection. So w transpose x divided by square root of wt that is in centimeters the length from here to here. And if I'm on the other side, then I will get a negative number. Okay, that's just something you can try around with. So this is the basis of the whole thing. So now if we are in higher dimensions, let me draw it again. So in higher dimensions, for example, our hyperplane is the blackboard, and my vector is a point over here. I can also project it down onto the board, okay? And then I can do the same calculations and everything is the same. The key is W transpose x divided by this thing will be exactly the length. However, if I only care for the sign, let's simplify our life and just look at this one. Okay? It is arbitrarily scaled, but the sign of it will tell me whether I'm on one side or whether I'm on the other side. By the way, so what's happening if this is equal to zero? Uh, maybe I draw the image again, so it wasn't that bad. So this is my vector w, this is the plane. And if I project a point over here, I will get a number positive. If I'm right here on the plane, I will project down to this location, and I will have w transpose x being equal to 0. Okay, and if I'm on the other side, I get a negative number. I don't know how to get this. So, okay, so far so good. So this is defining a hyperplane. So now let's get back to the classification problem. So we call a hyperplane separating for some given data with these labels if um, the inner product is greater than 0 for, one, for the one class and less than 0 for the other one. So now what's the role of the B? The role of the B is basically now shifting around our plane. So in this picture here, the origin would be here. So this is a zero, right? So that means all my hyperplanes defined like that are kind of going through the origin. But I might want to have a hyperplane which is going like this. And there I basically need an offset which is then the b. So I'm shifting the result of the inner product with the b and that is defining an offsetted hyperplane. So basically the w defines a hyperplane going through the origin with a certain orientation defined by this normal vector, and then the b allows me to move it up and down, okay? Good, so far so good. Now we can also write this condition here, more convenient as an inequality that everything is greater than zero. And the trick, how we do it, we multiply the result by the label, where the label was plus one or minus one. And this is exactly the reason why we are using plus one and minus one as labels. We could have used plus one and zero as labels, but then we couldn't have used this super convenient trick of writing it down. Yeah? Good, so far so good. Now, a decision function can be derived from a hyperplane, and the obvious way to do it is we just look at the sign of the inner product of w and x plus b. That's it. So given a w and a b, we can define a decision function, okay, for our hyperplane. Great. 
So there's one subtlety here. What about the equal to zero thing? Okay, so the sine function, I'm, I'm using a version where the sine of zero is plus one, okay? But that's like a little subtlety which is irrelevant here. Good, so far so good. Um, now let's learn a bit more about separating hyperplanes. So suppose we have a separating hyperplane for some data represented by W and B. Curiously, also if we scale W and B, if we scale it up with some scalar C, positive number, yeah, we will get exactly the same hyperplane. Nothing changes. We can scale it up arbitrarily and it doesn't change. That was the business of basically rescaling the length of W. However, we also need to rescale the offset parameter here because it depends on the norm of W for a particular plane. So written mathematically, if we have basically for, a, oops, if we have for a data point that like it's on the right side of the hyperplane, we can arbitrarily scale these up and it doesn't change it. Mathematically, you can drag out the C from the inner product here. You can drag it out from the inner brackets here. Yeah, and since it's a positive number, you can just divide by it and get rid of it like that. Okay, so that's the proof that you can arbitrarily scale it with a C. However, the C must be positive. Otherwise, all decisions are flipped. So now, how should this constant be chosen? That's super arbitrary. But we want to have a definite programming problem, which has a unique solution. For this, we introduce the so-called canonical separating hyperplane. Yeah, so we know what a hyperplane is. We know what a separating hyperplane is. Next. Let's learn what a canonical separating hyperplane is. So, first of all, yet another name. So this expression over here is called the so-called functional margin. I have no idea why it's called functional, but it's not the geometrical one. It's not the one that you can put a ruler on. That will be the geometrical margin, which we define later on. That is another one. Let's call it functional margin. And now we say a separating hyperplane is called canonical if the smallest functional margin is 1. So smallest with respect to what? I mean, if we talk about separating hyperplanes, we have a data set, and so we can plug in the whole data set into this expression, calculate for each data point the functional margin, and we want to have the minimum of all these functional margins to be 1. Okay? And this can be always achieved by tweaking around with the C. Okay? We can always adjust the C, to achieve this property here. Okay, great. So any separating hyperplane can be made canonical by rescaling. Okay, because the one is an arbitrary number that we choose here. We could have chosen a hundred, or we could have chosen any number that is uh, really greater than zero. So every any strictly positive number could have been chosen here. So one is the most natural choice. Again, note that by changing our hyperplane to be canonical, we are not changing the decision function at the end, right? So that was the story up here, that we can arbitrarily rescale the hyperplane and it doesn't change the decision. Great, so far so good. Let's get to the geometrical margin. So that is again the margin that we want to measure with our ruler on the board, okay, in centimeters. So we really want to know what the distance is. And this can be done by renormalization. So we normalize by 1 divided the norm of W. And the norm of W is the square root of W transpose W. So that's the same thing. Okay? And those are exactly the factors that we had on the board that are like missing to get like the measure, measurable ones. <coughs> so let's plug it into this and see what's happening. So basically we can rescale now. This, um, this thing by 1 divided by w, okay, we can do it and we can drag it into the inner brackets and we can drag it also into the inner product here, okay? So now the geometrical margin, which is this expression, yeah, measures really the distance of a data point xi to the separating hyperplane. So that is really measuring exactly that. So why, where are we heading? Why are we interested in this? We want to maximize the margin, so we have to make sure that we are not maximizing the margin just by scaling up some arbitrary parameter c, right, and getting a non-canonical plane. But the plan will be, we want to formulate it in such a way that we always look at the canonical hyperplane, but then we are orienting our hyperplane in such a manner that the geometrical margin is maximized, okay? So, with other words, the geometrical margin is independent in a way of the scaling because we define it to be the exact scaling such that w has length 1. Okay, that's another point of view. 
So the canonical one is rescaling it in such a way that for the, the smallest margin will be one, and the geometrical one is rescaling it such that those will be exactly the ones that you measure with a ruler on the board. So the geometrical margin now allows us to choose among the possible separating hyperplane to choose that one that kind of maximizes the margin, okay? Because they are now on the same scale. So furthermore now we define what is the margin of a canonical separating hyperplane. Yeah, you know what a hyperplane is, you know what separating means, you know what canonical means. So it is basically the minimal geometrical margin. Okay, so the minimum over all data points of this geometrical margin. So if we calculate this, the one divided by the norm is a positive scalar. We can drag it out of the minimum. Okay, so it's not an argmin, it's a minimum. And then the minimum of this functional margin in here has been chosen to be one for a canonical hyperplane. So being canonical, I know that this minimum is equal to one. And so that means that the margin of a canonical separating hyperplane is 1 divided by the norm of W, okay? That is non-trivial to me at least, right? If you have a hyperplane defined by W and B, right, what is the size of the margin? Here we got a formula for this. If you have a data set and you kind of choose the canonical form of it, then it will be 1 divided by the norm of W, okay? So now why did we need all these notions, functional margin, geometrical margin, canonical, and all this stuff? Why did we need this? We needed it to derive this formulation here, right? So we want to have this 1 divided by w. Because now we can say, what is the max margin classifier? Max margin classifier maximizes the margin by minimizing the norm of w, right? Because the margin is 1 divided the norm, so if we minimize the norm of W, we are maximizing the margin. Then we need to ensure that our hyperplane is separating the data. So we need to fulfill this constraint. And we have this greater or equal to 1, where the 1 is now ensuring that we are looking for the canonical hyperplane. Okay? So this can be now written as a constraint optimization problem. So we minimize the norm of W, and we minimize it in two variables, in W and B. However, the B does not appear in here. The P only appears in the constraints. So the constraints say all data has to be classified correctly, yeah? And um, the functional margin should be, um, the smallest possible value should be one. So now you might ask, so are we really achieving the smallest possible value? Let's think about it. We are minimizing the norm of W, so we are trying to make W as short as possible, yeah? At the same time, the inner product of W with some other number should be greater or equal to 1. So that basically means this constraint in here is kind of trying to um, increase the W in such a way that we are greater or equal than 1. So the constraint tries to increase the W to fulfill all constraints, while the function that we are minimizing is minimizing the norm. So somehow this minimization is pushing, yeah, the margin right at the one, at least for some of the data points. Okay, so this inequality kind of ensures that for all data points, we are at least one, yeah, and suppose all of them are greater or equal than 10, great, then we can reduce our w further, we, because that would make our objective function happy, right? Yeah, right, suppose you have a w which kind of has this, um, this expression down here, not greater or equal to one, but greater or equal to 10, Okay, then we could make our optimization problem more happy yeah, by minimizing the W even further and pushing, downscaling the W and the B so that we are not greater or equal than 10, but greater or equal than 1. Okay, so that's the, combi the clever combination of a minimization in W and having inequality constraints in that direction kind of will lead to a nice solution here. Now the question, of course, is can we replace this one by some other number, yeah? And as I said, the one is connected to being canonical. In principle, it can be any number, yeah? And it will just rescale our w up a bit if we would put another number in here. However, it should not be zero, okay? And what's happening if it's zero, you will see in some exercise, okay? I can also tell you approximately 
I mean, if it can be zero, kind of we can let the w go to zero as well, right? I mean, and then there's no point for the whole thing. Right? Making everything zero, w being equal to zero, b being equal to zero, of course, all constraints are fulfilled. And this function that we want to minimize is super happy, right? Because it's zero as well. So having here a zero is not possible, but having here 10 to the minus 14, that would be possible, okay? By the way, this one is basically ensuring that there is some margin at all, right? Since this is a functional margin to both sides. Good, so far so good. Um, that's already the answer to some exercises. We derived some optimization problem, yeah? Maximize the margin while ensuring proper separation. Again, we are talking about the separable case, so this should be possible. Okay, so there's no problem with it to find a solution. There must be a solution because we're looking at the linearly separable case. <coughs> this thing is called the primal problem. And if you see the word primal, there must be somewhere also the word dual. Okay, so there's the primal problem and there's also a dual problem. So the dual problem is one way to solve this optimization problem. Ho however, there are also direct ways. So you can directly plug this problem into optimization software and I think that will be a yet another exercise for you to do, okay? However, I show you how to plug the dual problem into an optimizer and then you just have to do the same thing. So, we can derive the so-called dual problem, which I already mentioned now, but what is it? The dual problem is another optimization problem, which might be easier to solve. But when you solve the dual problem, you also solve the primal problem, okay? So that's basically it. And, um, how can we get the dual problem? We get it with the method of Lagrange multiplier, okay? I don't know whether you have heard about it. So people who took a numerics class, they know about it maybe, hopefully, right? People who didn't, they don't know it. They maybe thought only minimizing some function without side condition is already fun, but it's more fun to have side conditions, right? Then you have more complicated problems and you can use this method of Lagrange multiplier. That is a quite sophisticated method, which I repeat for you, or I give you a short introduction in 10 minutes. So, there are many details you might not understand, but I give you the gist of it. Hopefully enough, right, to do the exercises, and enough for you to decide whether you want to look up the Wikipedia page on it, okay? Good, so what is this Lagrange stuff? So there's a so-called Lagrange duality. So here, here's a pointer. So I'm following now section five of Andrew Engie's Stanford class, okay? He has a really nice write-up on the whole topic. So the section five is, of course, on support vector machines, and he's also deriving this Lagrange stuff, okay? So that's like some extra material for you. And now I'm pointing you to these two excellent books from Stephen Boyd, in particular the one on convex optimization. That's also if you want to know even more details. They are in here. And then if you want to know even more and more details, you should take a numerics class, okay? So that's typically content in there. So here comes the method of Lagrange multiplier. Suppose we have a constraint optimization problem. Typically it's written now more abstractly. So we have some function f of w, which is a scalar valued function here. So I'm dropping this um, convention from the matrix differential calculus. So f is a scalar at the end, okay? That is the function we want to minimize and we have some side conditions. In this case now, for the simple set setup, we have equality constraints, okay? So let's draw an example. What do I mean by an optimization problem with a constraint set? So suppose we are optimizing some parabola in 2D, okay? It's like having a salad dish, okay? So this is like a salad dish or a satellite dish or whatever dish you like, and Basically, you want to minimize it in this area. You want to minimize the functional value of this 2D function. So you can really view the function value like a dish going out of the board. That is a function value, and you want to minimize it by going down here. That's normal optimization. Typically, calculate the derivative. You set it to zero if it's a squared function, and you jump right into it. However, let's assume we have a constraint set, so we are looking for the solution which is on this line, okay? So we are only allowed to choose solutions on this line, and then we want to minimize the function. By visual inspection, we see it must be that point over here, right? Because the isolines kind of they tell us 
So cross as many ISO lines as possible, but stay on the line over here. And this is right this location. Okay, and this is what constraint optimization is about. However, there are more complicated things. So maybe this is the function you want to minimize. And this is the function that is telling you your constraint sets, right? Of course, it's much harder. Now, this is a nonlinear constraint, and this is a linear constraint. So you see, for the linear constraint, under certain conditions of my function, it's, its convexity, it is very nice to optimize, and I get a good solution. Here, it's kind of unclear. So this will be the optimum, but I don't know. Maybe there's another wiggle like this. And so it's very hard to compare all these solutions in high dimensional spaces. Okay, so if the constraint sets get too complicated, the whole thing gets too complicated. So this is constraint optimization. Again, here broken down to a super simple case. So the hi of w is calculating some function, for example, a linear function in w, yeah, and that should be equal to zero. Okay, this is a possible. You could, for example, have a linear constraint by saying matrix times w plus offset should be equal to zero. So that would define like a linear constraint set. You could also define some other function and that should be equal to zero. It's like having an implicit function kind of formulation. How do we solve this problem? We solve it by defining the Lagrangian. This is just another word. Yeah, It's called the Lagrangian because it's a method of Lagrange. Okay, So Lagrange got a special role in here. The Lagrangian function, so what is it? It is a function of w, the variable that we wanted to optimize, and some new variables. And this new variable here is called the Lagrange multiplier. So what's the role of those? The role of the Lagrange multiplier is to combine now my objectives that I wanted to minimize with the constraints. So I put the constraints into a new function. And basically, I'm putting these beta i, those scalars, I'm just putting them in front of the h of w. So now what I changed here, I removed the constraints, but now having a higher dimensional optimization problem. So suppose the w was two dimensional and I had 10 constraints, then now I'm having a 12 dimensional optimization problem. Okay, so before I only optimize over w, now I have to optimize over w and beta. Okay, so going from an constraint optimization problem to an unconstrained optimization problem, but with more variables. Okay, so far so good. How do we solve it? We calculate the partial derivatives with respect to w and with respect to beta. I don't care which method you use, right? That's not important here. You could use matrix differential calculus, but that's irrelevant for now here. So you can set this Lagrangian to zero, and then you can play around with it and solve for w and beta. Yeah, so basically here you have the starting point, turn it into the Lagrangian, calculate derivatives, and then you have more equations to play around with it and to get an algorithm. Um, there's a nice page really on, the, on Wikipedia, which you can click on over here, which is basically explaining the method in great detail. And it's very well made. Yeah? And if there's something unclear, you can comment on the page and ask for more explanation, of course, right? I mean, that's how Wikipedia works. So again, here's this image that I showed you. Now I'm using x and y instead of w because I copy and paste it, OK? So this is a function I want to minimize. There's these iso lines. This is some nonlinear constraint. In this case, the g of x, y should be equal to c. I wrote it being equal to 0, so that really doesn't matter. In general, you would write down the Lagrangian like that, and then you calculate the derivatives of that one, so basically the gradient with respect to x and y. And if you do that, basically you get the gradient of f, which is that one, and you get the gradient of minus lambda x with respect to x and y. And when you set it to 0, yeah, you get this equation kind of. That's the gradient of the function is the same as lambda times the gradient of your constraint. So this following from setting the Lagrangian, the derivative of the Lagrangian, to zero, okay? And that basically is expressed by this little two arrows here, which are pointing kind of into opposite directions. So the gradient for one function should be equal to the gradient of the other function. That is the optimal location that we are after. And then one can do more stuff and derive more things that then basically we can show that at this point um, the constraint will be fulfilled. Right? But there are some steps missing in between here. What you sh should take from this is just 
um, by combining this expression from the constraint optimization problem into one function and then going on calculating with it, kind of you can get a solution that fulfills the constraints. Good, here's a more general point of view. We could also have additionally inequality constraints, where now inequality means um, not being on this line, but being on one side of the line. So that's why you want to find a solution, okay? So in this image here, it would mean, um, please find me a solution which is on this side of the line, okay? That would be a linear inequality constraint. You could also say, I want to be on this side of this curve, then that would be a nonlinear inequality constraint, okay? And they are kind of related, but this is the general form. Now, if I'm a, a, a numeric superhero, okay, that would be the problem to work on, okay? That's what I'm looking at. That's for what I want to write algorithms. And then you are machine learning guys. If you want to use my algorithms, bring it to this form, okay? And then you can run my method. And of course, the support vector machine optimization problem looks, looks a bit like this, right? We have less than or equal than one, okay? It's similar. You can bring the one to the other side and then you have your zero. Here we have the norm of W. We don't have an equality constraint. However, let's look at it a little bit more. Ah, again, I didn't show you the slide. So I just showed this, right? And the, the, this F of W is the norm of W for the support vector machine. And this inequality is almost like the one for the support vector machine. But we have a less than or equal than one. And we kind of have to bring the one to the other side. And then we have less than or equal to zero, OK? Good, so far so good. Let's write down for this one the Lagrangian. So in this case, we know already for the equality constraints, we introduce Lagrange multipliers over there, so these betas, and put them onto this function here. But also for the inequality constraints, we can put in and include them here. Yeah? However, now we have to be a little bit careful. Um, we get another side condition that the alpha i are greater than 0. And that has something to do, greater or equal than 0, that has something to do that those are inequality constraints, okay? So now the question is always, this is less than or equal than zero. Why do it that way? If you would put a greater or equal to zero, then this constraint for the alpha would be the other way around. So we want to have for the variables that we are optimizing with simple constraints. That's why we need to formulate our inequality constraint up here a little bit weird with the less than or equal, okay? But it's just one or the other, okay? And basically now, one can also go through the theory and one can show that the Lagrange method also works for inequality constraints. Now, more names. The W is called the so-called primal variable, or with other words, that is the variable we are optimizing in the primal formulation. And the alpha and beta are called the dual variables, or with other words, those will be the variables we are optimizing over in the dual problem, okay? Curiously, when we solve for the alpha and beta and the dual problem, we get a solution, and we can calculate also the solution for the primal problem and vice versa, if we fulfill certain properties. So the Lagrangian is a function of all of them, OK? So um, first of all, um, we can define the primal problem here to be a problem that is minimizing the w of this function here. So we are maximizing out the Lagrangian with alpha and beta, and we get the so-called primal problem here. For every w, we have the, a problem here that is formulated as a maximization itself. So the inner function is the maximum, which we assume we know, okay? And if we maximize the result here in w, or if we minimize it, this is the primal problem. And we can also write the same thing down the other way around, and we get the dual problem. But let's look at it a bit more precisely. So the Lagrangian allows us to formulate two optimization problems. One is first maximizing with respect to the dual variables, and the other one is first maximize with respect to the primal variables, OK? Now, what is the relationship between these problems? For this, again, let's look at the unconstrained problem here. So, Let's write out the Lagrangian for this primal setup. Yeah, it will be this expression just plugged in. And let's think about it, what we get when we maximize in alpha and beta. So suppose that, um, that all constraints are fulfilled. Okay, So let's assume that the 
equality constraint is fulfilled, so it's equal to zero, that means that this summation is equal to zero. Okay? Let's also assume that the inequality is also fulfilled. That means here we have lots of negative numbers. Um, so now how can we... Um, Uh, oh, okay, and, but we have lots of negative numbers, so how can we maximize this expression in terms of alpha by setting alpha to zero? Because if we have another alpha, alpha equals to five, we would sum up here some large negative numbers, and we wouldn't maximize it. So if the constraint for a particular w is fulfilled, the inequality constraint, the best choice for the alpha will be to set alpha to zero, okay? So that means if these constraints, the primal constraints, are fulfilled, then this maximum over here is exactly the function that I want to minimize, my f of w, because the term at the end is zero, and this term will be zero because we have to choose our alphas in such a way that they are zero. Otherwise, we haven't maximized this expression. Okay? So, now we can write down the unconstrained problem and define the so-called primal value. So, Minimizing now this expression with respect to w, okay, this is called the so-called primal value, okay? So, in principle, having kind of an expression for this maximization of the Lagrangian, suppose we have a closed form solution for every w, yeah, then suddenly now we have an unconstrained problem for w, okay? So this is the idea here. We write it as a Lagrangian, we take the derivative with respect to alpha and beta, we plug in the solutions into this and hope that the alpha and beta disappear. And when they do disappear, then this maximum has a closed solution and we have an unconstrained problem in W. Okay? And the solution of Z1 is called the so-called primal value. However, often it's very difficult to get an expression for this um, theta p and we cannot solve it. So sometimes we want to look at the dual problem, and the dual problem is changing the roads. So kind of I'm trying to minimize my Lagrangian with respect to w, yeah? write down the derivative for fixed alpha and betas, and then plug in the solutions and hope for the best that the w disappears. And as we will see, this is what will happen when we apply to the support vector machine. Okay. So similarly, then we can define the dual value, which is basically now the solution that we get when we maximize this expression over alpha and beta. Okay, so in general, one can prove now, and this is going to the theory, that basically this primal, uh, dual value is less than or equal than the primal value. So there are some variables, like the primal variables, maybe w, and some others, which are the alphas and betas in some other space, and in one space, we are kind of maximizing or minimizing, okay, in the W space, yeah? And in the other space, we are minimizing, so we get a saddle point. That's where we want to be. And under certain condition, maximizing the other one, uh, one of them, and then minimizing the second one leads to the same point, okay? But in general, we have here an inequality, and the distance between them is called the duality gap. Now comes our additional assumptions. If our functions f, g, and h are convex, and the h is even affine, so affine meaning it's a linear function with some offset, okay? Convex basically means it's like a nice function which has a local optimum, okay? So it's a function that kind of has a nice bowl shape, okay? So that's convexity, basically. Um, in that case, one can show that the duality gap is zero, okay? That basically it doesn't matter whether I solve the dual problem or whether I solve the primal problem, okay? Furthermore, we call such a, uh, yeah, a solution is called then feasible if there exists like a solution um, for both of them. Then the whole problem is called feasible. And we have some additional conditions that are then fulfilled First, they look a bit random, these Karush kuhn tucker conditions, but basically they following, follow from setting the derivatives to zero. Okay, so basically setting the derivatives of the Lagrangian to zero, you get all these KKT conditions. We don't talk about it very much, we only need that one, that kind of at the optimal point, alpha star times g of w star will be equal to zero. So that is the condition that we need at the end. 
Anyway, so here's a short summary. It might have confused you, these, these details, and maybe you really need to read the Wikipedia page, or maybe I should read it myself next time as well. So we have the so-called primal problem, which has a particular form, and then we can define an unconstrained primal problem if we are lucky, right? However, this theta sub p is a maximization over the alpha and beta. And if I have a closed form solution, solution for that, I will have an unconstrained primal problem. Similarly, I can do the same thing for the dual variables, but I have additional side condition over here. So, either we solve the primal problem with our solver, or we solve the dual problem. Now, what is the dis difference between those two? So, it's about the dimensionality. So, the w might be a variable which is 10-dimensional, and we have 1,000 data points, which means we have 1,000 constraints. So you can choose whether you want to solve a problem with 10 dimensional variables and 1,000 constraints, or the dual, where now alpha is 1,000 dimensional, right? For every constraint, you get a single Lagrange multiplier. Um, however, the W kind of magically disappears, and you only have very simple side conditions, just positivity, which is, might be much simpler than the complicated ones over here. And basically, you can pick each of them. For the support factor machine, it turns out, in the linearly separable case, you can solve the primal directly. You can also solve the dual problem. However, for the nonlinear support factor machine, we will see that the dual problem is the one that you want to solve. That's why we now continue and derive the dual problem. So back to the SVM. Let's apply it, and then you see how it works. So how can we now derive a dual problem? I first show you. So Instead of having this minimization problem in W and B, I will derive on the board for you the dual problem, which is this one, and that's now a problem in alpha, where the alpha is a vector that has as many entries as there were constraints in the original problem. So the number of constraints in the original problem was the number of data points. So the alpha will be, um, if I have 1,000 data points, it will be 1,000 dimensional. How does the optimization problem look like? So it's just some expression in alpha. So this is a linear function in alpha. And here I'm having a squared function, a polynomial, a squared polynomial in alpha, OK? And the yi and yj and this inner product of these data points, they are just all given, right? I can pre-compute them once, and then I have an optimization problem in alpha. However, here's no w left. What constraints do I have? I have the positivity for the alpha. They are coming from this in being inequalities in the primal, and I have some equality constraint which looks like that. Okay, so now how do we derive it? So we need to set up the Lagrangian, which is written up here. So the Lagrangian has the term minimize the norm of W is in here, and then I get here a minus sign, and the minus sign is from repositioning basically the constraint. So let's look at it. So basically, this is the constraint. If this is less than or equal to 0, yeah, it's the same as um, the constraint that I had before. OK, maybe that's the first thing I show you. So what do I have? What kind of constraints? So. Our original constraint was something like this, yi, and then we have the inner product of w and xi plus b, and that should be greater or equal to 1, OK? And now I need to shuffle around a bit. First of all, I'm changing the sign here and saying minus, minus, OK? That's the first step. Then I'm moving the 1 to the other side, so I'm having 1 minus. And then I'm having this equality form that I really wanted. OK? So let's look back how I wrote it down here. So that's almost what I wrote down. I wrote not 1 minus this expression, but I wrote this expression minus 1. And then I put a little minus sign in front. OK? So that's how I got the Lagrangian. Now let's take the derivative of this with respect to w and with respect to b. OK? Let's see whether we can do it. So. First of all, the derivative of the norm, which is just w transpose times w, it will be just w, OK? So the 2 will generate us a factor of 2, which is canceling against the 1 half. So that is just w. 
What about the rest here? So if I take the derivative with respect to w, uh, maybe do you want to see it in detail, or do you want, are, you, are you happy with it? And uh, maybe there is at least one person that wants to see it in detail. So let's do it. So basically, and we can use matrix differential calculus, right? Why not? So I'm putting a d in front of the l of w, comma, b, comma, alpha, which is a d of a half norm of w, which I now write like that, okay, yes, still correct, minus the summation of alpha i, then comes the yi um, bracket inner product of w x i plus b minus 1, this was my constraint, and that is multiplied with the alpha i, and I sum up over all of those. Okay, great. So this is what I want. And another bracket close for the d. So let's do this. So the d of a half w blah, it's product rule, right? dw transpose times w and w transpose times dw. Turn it around and it will be w transpose times dw. Okay? And the a half cancels against this that I have two terms. Then I have a d in front of the summation. I can drag it in. I can drag it in. And then I have it in front of this expression. So let's do that. So summation over the i, alpha i. And then I have d of y i w x i plus b minus 1. And I can drag it into the first summand and the second summand. For the second summand, it's a constant, so it's gone. d of this one is 0. I can drag out the y, so let's do it by erasing. So I get a y i here. Then I have a d in front of this expression. Again, a summation. Now I'm interested in the derivative of this one, of the w. So this one is constant, it, so it's gone. And I can drag in the d inside that one and uh, get this one as a derivative. Okay, so basically it's, uh, let, let me do it by erasing, okay? So dragging it into this expression now gives me an xi transposed dw, okay? So that, that's it basically. And I can do the same thing for the b, and for the b I will get, by the way, let's put the brackets like that now. I can drag it out the w. Um, for taking the derivative with respect to b, the first term cancels out, so it's dl. It will be just the minus summation over i, alpha i, yi, and then I have the db. Okay, so here now we can read off the derivatives. Okay, everyone fine with that one? So basically, I'm having a d in front of this expression. There is no b, so it's 0, fine. So I'm having a d over here. I can drag it. The alpha I can drag out. I can take out the yi. Then I have a d in front of this expression. This one is constant with respect to b. And so I'm just remaining with the db over here. So this is my derivative with respect to b. This is my derivative over here. OK, I can drag it further out. This is my derivative with respect to w, OK? So I hopefully this is what I wrote down. Yes, that's what I wrote down. So this is basically the derivative with respect to w. This is the derivative with respect to b. So I can um, equate this to 0, and I get an expression for w, OK? So I get the expression that w is equal to this summation. And here I get some other weird constraint. How do I get to that one down here? OK. More derivation. So let's do it. <coughs> so um, basically, we have this Lagrangian. Ah, 
Uh, let me use the other notation. I like the other one more, so let's use this one. This one, okay. Minus one, bracket close. And now let's plug in what we found out. We found out that the w is equal to the summation of the alpha i, y i, x i, right? That's what we found out. Let's plug this expression in for the w, okay? When we plug it in here, we plug it in twice, and then basically we are um, having the inner product of this expression. So this is a vector because the xi are the vectors, and those are scalars, okay? So the first term will be summation over i and j. Then I have terms alpha i, alpha j, y i, y j, and I have the inner product of x i with x j. So basically, when you plug in this summation for the first vector and for the second vector, you can drag out the summations and all the constant factors out of the inner product, and what will remain will be the inner product between the two data points. Okay? Similarly, is the same stuff is happening over here. So here, basically, we have one uh, minus. We plug it in. In there, a summation. Again, we can drag out a summation. We can drag out the alpha. We can drag out the y. And what remains is basically the same stuff as here. So we get alpha i, alpha j, where this alpha i is coming from here. This alpha j is coming from the summation over there. Okay, And then we have y i, y j, and x i transpose x j. This is the first part. Um, what about the b? So let's see what's happening there. Uh, how do we get rid of it? Um, so we are still having this term minus the summation alpha i y i times b. Okay? And that term, how do I get rid of it? Or more precisely, minus 1. Right? Ah, now it's getting a bit messy over there. So, those were these terms up to here. Let's not forget about the last term. So that is summation over the i. Alpha i, then I have y i times b. And I have the summation over the alpha i times minus 1. Okay, so plus summation over the alpha i. So this term here is equal to 0. Why? Because that was the second derivative over here. Okay? So that's how it disappears. <coughs> so this thing is gone, and the rest stays. That's our solution. Let's reshuffle it. So we have summation over the alpha i. Then we have the summation, which has exactly the same sum, but we have a half minus 1. So we get minus a half of the summation of the alpha i, alpha j, y i, y j, x i, x j. And this is now the dual objective where I'm additionally having this constraint. Okay, that's how to derive it. So it's always a bit confusing because there are so many equations, and it's always a question, when do, we, do you need which one, right? And it was a bit surprising the moment when we plugged in that one. Okay. Good, so that's how we derived the dual. Now, why is it fantastic? Because we, we did the derivative with respect to w here and to, with respect to b, plugged in, these conditions, and then W and B are gone, okay? And that's very nice, because now the dual problem is not the maximum over a minimum, but the, it's just the maximum over some other function, okay? So we found a closed form solution for this other function, which is good. So, brief summary, we have the primal formulation, which looks surprising at first, but we derived it with the functional margin and with all these notions at the beginning, and then we use some Lagrange magic to derive an equivalent problem. 
And now to solve the optimization problem, we can pick both. Typically, this one is picked because later on, the inner product here will be replaced by a kernel function and we have a nonlinear method. But this will be next time, okay? Today, we will also solve that one because that's like the typical standard way to do it. So here's the linear support vector machine algorithm for the separable case. Given some training data, find an alpha that solves the dual problem here. And then we can use the alpha to formulate our decision function, right? We just plug in w being equal to the summation of the alpha i, y i, x i, and we get basically this as our solution. What's still missing is how is the b calculated? Where do we get the b? How do we get from the alpha the b bag? Okay? And that is what I will explain to you next. Now we need these KKT conditions from optimization. So don't worry too much about it. Those are conditions that follow from derivatives being equal to zero, approximately, okay? So the KKT condition for this problem, when you write it down, will be that the constraint multiplied with each Lagrange multiplier is at the optimum equal to zero for all i. This means now we can make a case distinction. So there are some alpha i's, okay, which are um, zero. In that case, this expression can be anything. Okay, those are not the interesting one, but then there are others, basically where alpha i is greater than zero, yeah, those are the interesting ones, because then this expression here is exactly equal to zero, otherwise, right, if alpha i is five, then the second factor must be zero, which means that those are xi's where we hit basically the margin exactly, right? So where our offset function gives us exactly one. Okay, so those are the xi's that lie exactly on the margin. And they get a special name. Those are the so-called support vectors. Yeah? And we will graphically see why it makes sense to call them like that. They are basically supporting the separating hyperplane. They are kind of defining where it is, these ones, okay? And for convenience, let's call the set of indices of support vectors S. That just makes it now easier to calculate the B. So again, for the W, we have an expression. Yeah, we can just uh, use this expression here. We have alphas, and then we can calculate it, great. For the B, um, we need to transform this equation for our support vectors, yeah, and if we transform it, basically saying that if this is equal to one, it's the same as that the b is equal to one divided by y minus the inner product, right? This is just solving this inner, uh, this, this part from here to there. If that is equal to zero and you solve for b, you're getting exactly this equation here. Now the next step is that surprisingly for the yi, one divided by y is the same as y. Why? Because y is plus one or minus one, okay? So in that case, kind of it doesn't matter whether it's one divided or whether it's just the value itself. So the bi's here are defined to be yi minus the inner product, so just the offset. And they are approximately the same, however, in practice, we typically average them. So we take all support vectors, calculate the bi, and then we average them, and then we have our offset. So this is a bit more complicated here to get the offset b, okay? The w is nice and simple, but for the b, we have to do some extra work here. Good, so far so good. That was the theory. Let's see how to implement it, okay? So how can we implement it? So Let's implement the dual of the linear SVM. So we need to implement this optimization problem. How do we do it? We go to our numerics persons and ask for a quadratic programming solver, okay? Often they are super expensive. There are some commercial companies who are really good at this and they sell them and they make lots of money, right? Because why are they useful? These kind of solvers are also used for crash tests, for example, where you have finite element methods. They are also written down as an optimization problem where you have lots of little points and triangles for some car or something, and then you simulate a crash test, for example. And this can be done by these solvers, okay? That's why they are so powerful and why they are commercially successful and you can make money with them. And what does this quadproc function solve? They're solving like a generic 
optimization problem which has a particular form. And so since it's a quadratic programming problem, it means that the objective function is a quadratic function. And that is written here now as like the, the, the product of a vector times a matrix times a vector. So that is a scalar, right? And that is a way kind of to write a polynomial of degree two for a vector valued variable. And then often it also has a linear term, right? So now if I want to uh, translate this dual into this form, I now need to define what is Q and what is C, okay? So that's what I now need to do. Similarly for the constraints, the constraints are kind of generic. So we have some matrix times X less than or equal to a vector B. So that's a way to formulate inequality constraints. And often there's a second matrix for equality constraint and the second vector. And then typically these optimizers, they also allow you to define lower and upper bounds for the variables you're optimizing, okay? So this is basically the signature of the function that you get from the numerics person. So let's translate it now. So basically we can rewrite it as a linear, uh, as a quadratic program by kind of rewriting it in a vectorized manner. So we need to find some matrix Q, which is exactly this matrix. So where each row of X is a data point, and when you take the outer product and you multiply from the left and the right with the Y, you are doing exactly the right thing to get this expression as a matrix. Okay, this is something that is non-obvious. Yeah, this is something you need to try on a piece of paper, that this thing is doing the right thing. However, intuitively, multiplying with the diagonal matrix from the right is rescaling the columns. Multiplying with the diagonal matrix from the left is rescaling the rows of a matrix. Okay, this is something that you need to figure out, and when you've done this, then you will see that that's exactly the operations that you need up here for this expression. Then note that we kind of removed the minus sign and wrote a plus sign. The reason being, here we maximize and here we minimize, okay? That's a common mistake. Then the summation over the alpha i can be written by as the inner product of the one vector with my vector alpha. That's just summing up all entries. Now, what about the inequality constraint z1? So that's easy, right? I just need to reshuffle it a bit to have the right form. And this one over here can be also just written as the inner product of y and alpha being equal to zero. Okay, so this is my reformulation. Having this reformulation, now I can match with my quad proc implementation, and this is exactly the assignment that you need for the call, okay? So when you implement it, you just need to implement this assignment down here, and everything will be fine. Now, what if your quad proc is not there and you also have to implement it by hand, yeah, which is often the case? I will show you code how to do it. Let's first go through the theory here. So, or maybe let's do it like this. You wanted to see intermediate code. So let me first show you the implementation of the linear SVM as a quadratic program, okay? So let me find it. So it's in here. So this is lots of code. Um, so this is the implementation. This is the linear SVM for the separable case, and I have to assign the Q matrix, which is this diagonal expression stuff. I need to define the vector C, and then my result will be just a crud proc call, where I call the Q and the C, and I say the AEQ is this vector Y, cleverly reshaped, and the BEQ is some cleverly reshaped one, and so on and so forth. Then I calculate the set of support vectors, right? Because I'm interested in estimating the B as well. And then the B is just the average of this Y minus the inner product. And here you just need to be careful kind of that you only pick the support vector. So support vectors is a Boolean vector and in NumPy you can just multiply with it. And then where there's true you get a one, where there's false you get a zero. And you need to divide by the right number. Yeah? So there are many sources where you can have a mistake. I think this version is working. Okay, so this is the implementation of the support vector machine. Let's get to the quad proc here. For this, we, need, we, we use some other optimizer, the so-called interior point nonlinear optimization method. So your numerics guys say, 
quad proc, ah, no, we don't do this. We don't have an optimizer. But we have a more general, more powerful optimizer that can do this down here. Look at this. So this is even more fancy. Uh, quadratic is fine, but this is kindergarten. We have this super complicated stuff. Any convex function you can plug in here. Any convex constraint you can plug in here, OK? And then we can solve it. So what do we have to do? We need to reformulate this thing into that form as well to implement now our quad proc, OK? And for that one, typically, you need to implement the gradients of the function and of the constraints, and typically also the Hessian of the Lagrangian, whatever that is. I did it for you. So those are the answers for the general quadratic program setup. Okay, so those, this is now where here the input are basically this setup here now. And if you want to translate it into an interior point method, this is your table to look at, how to translate everything. Okay, and surprisingly, the Hessian of the Lagrangian is just a matrix Q. Oh, that's convenient. Great. So um, I show you my code. So this is the implementation of quad proc. And basically, now this has all the inputs of the quad proc that I showed you on the board or on the slides. And then I need to translate it into the right call from scipy dot minimize. So there's a function in scipy that implements this interior point method that is given. And I can use it now to create a crud proc function that is then useful for my support vector machine. OK? So as a repetition, we can optimize the primal or the dual problem. And the, the trick is that we formulate our optimization prob problem as a quad proc. That's cool because then we can use the quad proc library function if we have one. If we don't have one, we need to um, implement our, the quad proc ourselves from some general optimizer. If we don't have a general optimizer, even worse, of course, then we also need to implement that one, which can be done by gradient descent and by some other tricks. Okay? So you see the way of thinking. The idea of the support vector machine is having starting point classification problem formulated as an optimization problem, and then plug the optimization problem in some other software. If the software is too expensive or not available, you implement it yourself. Okay, but that's basically the idea. Good, I show you now this, the rest of the code. Um, again, this code now, it's not easy. It's a bit complicated. So when you look at it and you don't understand it, um, you should spend at least as much time as I spent at it to write it, right? I, it took me like seven hours to write this. It took really long, right? But nice 3D graphics, so you cannot expect to understand it right away, right? I had to look up all functions. I need to look up every line. So please do it as well, yeah? Before you say it's too difficult, right? It is difficult, but it's all there and it's working. So libraries and helper function. I don't show you every detail here of the helper function. I showed you the implementation of the quad proc already. Always, you should have some test code, OK? So this is some test code where I run MATLAB, which has a quad proc implementation. I got a solution, and then I run my own implementation, and I get the same numbers, OK? So that's good. I can trust it, OK? So quad proc, check. OK, it's done. And then comes the SVM for the separable case. I showed you the implementation already. I have some other function that can do the prediction here, which is just evaluating the inner product plus b and checking whether it's greater than 0. And I want to have the output as integers. Okay, That's just more convenient for the plotting. That's a prediction function. I can also calculate the accuracy, where I'm basically calculating here a Boolean vector. And then I'm calculating the mean over the Boolean vector, which is another NumPy feature then the true will be 1.0 and the false will be 0, 0.0, OK? Good. Let's use toy, da toy data. And let's first look at balance data here. So instead of showing you this one, I show you the answer. So the data are two Gaussian distributed blobs, OK? And then I run the support vector machine to get a W and a B, and I plot you here the planes. And part of the seven hours was plotting the planes. But now they are here, and it's very generic. So you can just um, you can just plot the planes by at margin 
into the figure and you give it the W and the B, okay? And then it will do all the calculations and give you the right computer graphics. And most of the time it works, okay? So this is the code. So of the, the toy data, I generate some toy data, shift one class by five, and we label one of the half of the data that it's minus one, and then I just plug in the data into my linear SVM function, okay? And this will give me a W, a B, and some alpha. I can calculate the accuracies and so on and so forth, and I can plot the data so to have a nice visualization. So what you can see here is, let's zoom into this, you can also see the support vectors. Oh, where are they? So the support vectors are the ones. There you see, that is the point that is like half bright. Uh, you can't see it on the screen. But that is one that is exactly on the plane, as you can see here. So it's exactly on the margin. Um, also for the other one, there are support vectors. And they are also right at the margin. You see there are two points that are right on the margin. And th those are the points that are supporting the separating hyperplanes. Okay, so that is exactly the points that are defining where it will be. Let's check that. And when you look at the alpha, you see that there are only three numbers which are non-zero. All the other alphas are zero. And if the alpha is equal to zero, we know that the y times blah, blah, blah constraint is not greater or equal to one, but it's strictly greater than one. That's why the alpha had to be zero for the KKT condition to be fulfilled. So those are not the support vectors. And there are three points which define this um, plane here. Why three points? Because in 3D, you need three points to define a plane, right? Otherwise, there would be still something wiggly. Good, I show you more examples. Yes. Ah, uh, it's over time. I show you. I show you a little bit more example. Finally, it also works with unbalanced data, so that's often a problem for many methods, for many optimizers. If you have unbalanced data, the problem is often that um, you always say class one, and you have already 90% accuracy, right? Because uh, you don't care for the small class. For support vector machine, it's different. The support vector machine perfectly works also if. In one class, there are only five data points. Why? Because it only cares for the points that are kind of supporting the separating plane. It doesn't care how many points are over there, right? It doesn't change the solution. Okay, yet another demo. I have the iris data that you know already. So for the separable case, I merge the Versicolor and the Virginica, and I show you the solution for this cluster against the blue cluster, okay? And again, um, you can run it, and you get like a nice separating hyperplane, which is just at the right location. Here you see one point. This one is on the is the support vector. That one and that one is also support vector. Okay, and of course that was a training set. I can also pr uh, plot it for the test set, and that's the last thing I tell you. For the test set, is curious. None of the blue points is touching the margin right, because the margin is defined on the training set. And even some of the points are like going over the margin on the other side. However, that's also cool, that's okay, can happen, right? Those are the points that I haven't seen before. Those are new points, and if there's noise on the data, of course, some of them will spill into the margin. Hopefully not over the separating hyperplane. Okay, and as a preview, next time I, we will look at the non-separating uh, plane, uh, non-separating case, then we will split the green and the red ones, and I show you what comes out. It also works, but it's kind of unclear what I really mean by margin here, right? So it's not so well defined here. So there I need some extra work, okay? And that's what we will look at next. So today we looked at the linearly separable case, and we derived it in every detail, maybe more detail than you wanted to know about it. I kind of gave you some fishy insights into the Lagrange multiplier, so that's a topic I'm also not super familiar with, but it's where this, this whole theory is based on, okay? And next time I will show you how to generalize it to the non-separable case, and ideally we will also start with the nonlinear case. Okay, thanks a lot for your attention, and I see you on Wednesday. <laughs>